Pastor Sindhyapan, will you just pray for us that all of us would argue well and fight well and uh, also think well and think through and uh, develop deep convictions that uh, there is a whole establishing process that Paul followed. Yes, George. We're tired of arguing and fighting. So we need really need no, the... Pastor. We should not. There is a whole idea about it. We should have we, fun. We need, we need there are more strength now to fight. <laughs> Come, let's pray. Father, we thank you for these days that, Lord, we could look into your word and discuss many different things, especially as, uh, Lord, as we are looking at the church, Lord, as a family of families, the household of God, and how uh, the first century church existed, Lord, as a family of God's people. Lord, we pray that even the discussions that we have today Lord, you bring edification and, and, and help us, O oh God, to, to glean the insights and apply them into our own lives, Lord, into our ministry. So, God, we pray that you would minister to us. Thank you for Dr. George and, Lord, even this bill ministry, uh, Lord, the uh, efforts that they have put into, Lord, to, into developing us, Lord in, uh, uh, Lord, in helping us to have this biblical perspective. So, God, we pray that you bless us together as your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, uh, we just uh, recap on that so that when we, when we know we would be a little more uh, clear. In Unit 3, setting the order, the concept of household within a household. In the West, we now live in a technological society rather than a traditional society, which often causes us to conceptualize and organize the church along organizational utilitarian lines rather than according to the new, according to the new Testament images of family and community. Does it matter? In his household text, Paul describes the church as a family and more accurately a family of families. He builds the entire social structure house order of the churches around this concept. Roles and responsibilities are assigned, which are consistent with this idea. The brilliance of this sort of social structure is readily understood and relevant to any culture at any point in, point in history, which is a crucial element in the multiplication of churches and the progress of the gospel. In this unit, we will attempt to summarize the social structure and life of the church into two categories, the individual household and the household of God. They will form the inner structure of our establishing strategy. That's the key thing. That's a key. They will form the inner structure of our establishing strategy. We will follow the natural order set out in the household text themselves. In the household, husbands, wives, parents, children, slaves, and in the household of God, ministers, of the gospel, elders, deacon, older men and older women, younger women and younger men, as well as a few special groups. Now, unit four, additional guidelines to the household of God. Building upon the study of from unit three, in this unit, we will comb the Pauline epistles again, comb the Pauline epistles again, read through the whole Pauline epistles again, drawing together all the essential guidelines given by Paul to the churches for them to function as mature, mature households of God. We will examine the following key areas that are important to the household functions, household functioning in, the, in a harmonious and effective manner. Leaders, men and women, handling conflict, assembly meetings, giving, financial matters, widows and special needs, community ministry and life and relationship with the world. So the, you can see the, that in, in three, we are just working on developing the idea of the church as a family, the fundamental primary philosophy that Paul uh, drives, that drives Paul's idea of church is the idea of family. And having that fundamental ideology with that, how uh, that we could use that same ideology to see that the church also runs like a family. And we are drawing that image. If there's a kind of an imagery that is there in both. And uh, that will becomes an, uh, sort of our core of our inner structure of our establishing strategy. Now in unit four, what we are going to do is we are basically 
now that the church is functioning as a family what are the implications so the implications are how do you handle conflict how do you how do leaders work how men and women participate assembly meetings how would you conduct an assembly meeting uh, giving and financial matters widows and so all of those ideas are there now i want you to turn with me to uh, page number 38 um, i'm not sure in your books where it is This is the mother read that mm -mm. okay in the answers the jeff's answers okay these are the only guys who give the question paper and the answer also setting in order the household of god Yeah. Uh, 38. Actually, when you open this uh, blue book, you know, the first section. So, in this page 38. But, Pastor, you need 3 and that page 38. No, the passages are different. It's the same thing. 38 is unit 4. Where? Where are you all going? This is this book, Pastor, which uh, gave us a printout of. Book, no? Yeah. One in that 38 is setting in order the household of God. Household exactly. Text. Correct. That that's, all. that's all. That's yeah, all. But that's unit four, no? No, no, no. That's you. Unit four is you can for, go forward. It is there. Ad additional guidelines for household of God is there. That is different. So setting in order the household of God. Let us read this completely so that I know that uh, all of our brains are a little unsorted. With, uh, uh, let's read like what Jeff is looking at. Okay. So it's very important for you to know that the biblical theology supersedes any of the scholarly articles. So we build biblical theology first. We uh, build biblical theology by reading the text given. Also text beyond what they have given, we can work on it. Because they don't touch Genesis in this at all. For me, I feel Genesis is a fundamental uh, basic guideline that we should use and therefore build your biblical theology and use articles primarily for relevance okay use articles only for relevance please don't base your entire uh, don't think that jeff is giving you that article because jeff believes that or jeff is trying to tell us teach us from that article jeff is giving us what the scholars have been thinking about Okay, and sometimes Jeff himself is biased. He has not given certain, uh, you know, different other views and things like that. So that's okay. We are we're still willing to you know work around that. Uh, so I, 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 nobody is going to argue. This is not a uh, debate thing. I'm I'm just sharing with you something. Uh, so we have one view, view number one. Number one is the complementarian view. Can someone read the definition I posted last time? I had posted a definition, if you can just uh, view number two. Yeah. Complementarianism, the view that God created men and women equal in personhood, but distinct in roles, both at home and in church. It affirms all Christian women have ministries of some kind, while denying they can teach or lead the church as a whole. Okay. So, <clears throat> complementarian is, you must have noticed, they're very clear that men equal to women. Do we all agree on that? In the personhood, absolutely equal. That's an amazing thing. That's a good thing. The only thing is, uh, can you read that again, Jeff? Roles. So there are three few words we need to really sort out. Roles. Yeah. Responsibilities. 
Yeah, I'll read it again, Pastor. Functions. These are all words that are interchangeably used. We have to be careful on those. Uh, this is not for argument. I'm just putting all our, our views on this thing that will help you to kind of uh, write your article. Okay. Uh, so, men equal to women. And then what did he say in the complementary view? Distinct in roles. Distinct in roles. So, what are the roles? Men are husbands. Women are wives. Men are fathers. Wives are mothers. So, this is the gender. This is uh, roles. Roles. Then, each of these roles would have responsibilities, right? So, we can, as a husband, uh, what is my role? As a father, what's my role? I mean, what's my responsibility? As a wife, what's my responsibility? Mother, what is my responsibility? So these responsibilities eventually are directly connected to men and women as their functions. That's what they tend to think. You know, that's what they're I, they're talking about, and they're distinct in their roles. So, I mean, we don't disagree with that. We are not at all. I'm I making no disagreement with that. That's a good thing. Okay, distinct in roles. Then, Josh, are you there? Yeah, both at home and in church. <laughs> Both, um, so distinct yeah. in roles at home and therefore in church also because home is like a image of what the church is that kind of a thing okay so mm -hmm. distinct in roles yeah uh, tell you the distinction they specify the distinction what is that yeah it affirms all christian women have ministries of some kind while denying they can teach or lead the church as a whole okay now, the complementarians only deny one thing. Deny means deny women in one area. That is, they cannot lead the whole church. Whole church. Okay? One. And they cannot authoritatively, authoritatively teach a man. That's all they're saying. So... It's not a bad thing. It's, a, it, it, it's okay. It's and I mean, most of the complementarians take good care of their women, so it's not a bad at all. Okay. So uh, many times we argued and all. I just wanted to say that it's not as bad as we think it is. Okay. And many of these people who follow this philosophy, the women are comfortable doing uh, the roles and taking up the responsibility that are given to them. Hospitality. Uh, you know, uh, teaching the women's group, teaching the children's group. That's the roles that they're given and they work on that. And the main teaching is done by the main pastor who is a man. That is basically the idea. And the elders and all will take part in the this thing. So it's not bad. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, we though we argued against it and things like that. It's just for us to see that they, they, they work properly. They work. If everyone in the community is following this, and are happy knowing that this is the will of God. I think absolutely no problem with this. Okay. Now, can you read me the egalitarian view? Yeah. The view that God created men and women equal in personhood and indistinguishable in roles. Men and women are distinct from one another, but these distinctions do not deny leadership within the church. So, men and women are equal in personhood. And equal in roles. roles. Now, you know why I don't agree with the Galatians? Because you know what? The roles are equal, not equal in roles. I, 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 don't, I don't agree with that. I mean, I have a problem with that. I can, what I'm saying is husband is equal to wife. As man is equal to woman, husband is equal to wife. Father is equal to mother. So... Uh, but they have different roles. So the roles cannot be the same. So, but the philosophy that, and here they have a problem that they, they allow women to, can you just read that whole thing again? Yeah. The view that God created men and women equal in personhood and indistinguishable in roles. 
Indistingu indistinguishable in roles. That's a funny thing. I mean, how is that possible? We have different roles, right? I'm a husband. I have a different role. Wives have a different role. Uh, father has a different role. I mean, I know that my father, whatever he does, cannot do mother's role of a role of breastfeeding. Unless he had hormones or something and then he grew up everything that can be used. So, I mean, that's a place egalitarians, you know, they goof up a little bit. Okay. Then, about the church. Men and women are distinct from one another. But these distinctions do not deny leadership within the church. Distinctions do not deny leadership roles. Okay? That's view. Now, view number three is oneness view, which you can tell you got, you can write this from uh, that in a Socratic discussion and you can use uh, my name also in your Socratic discussion or in your presentation. And you can say that here we did biblical theology. We used Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and 5. And we, you can build that theology. And the view here is man and woman are one. Man and woman. is not, We don't have the idea of equal. No, no. That's not what we are talking about. They are one. So here, when they lead, they lead as one. Family lead. Family leads. Okay. Other families support. Other families support. So that is the model that the oneness model that you can see, and you can take it from Socratic discussion and put it there. And uh, um, so uh, the families play the different roles and responsibilities in the church. Um, so there are men and women, men and women, men and women, men and women. Now within the family dynamic, if the, uh, you know, it is, if there is a lot of freedom, I would say that how they function. Okay. But the family, lead, one family leads, another two family support, and it is a family leadership uh, or what we call as, we consider the man and woman as one unit. So you can explain all these three, th three, these three things. Okay. So the, apart from this, I have one more thought that I thought I'll share. Um, now, imagine man is the head. What is the wife? We have called the man as the head. Wife is the? Wife is also head. No, no. In the, in the traditional view or the... Okay, we will put it as wife is one who submits. George is the one who is the neck who turns the head. The agreed, agreed, absolutely, Pastor. Now imagine the wife is submitting to the husband. Okay, and the husband leads the wife in that model. Now here is a son, son one watching this model. What does he learn? He learns two things. He learns leadership. That means loving, caring, loving, caring, serving leadership. As he sees his father lovingly, caringly, serving as a leader in the church, in the house. That means... He actually, in his leading, he actually serves his wife. And the son sees and witnesses that leadership. Now, the same son also sees his mother submitting to the leadership of the father or the husband. And he learns submission in that. Okay. So one, he learns leadership, one, he learns submission. Now, what's the advantage of this? Son one, go, son one goes to Infosys. No pun intended, okay? 
Infosys. Now this son gets a job. He is a uh, software coder. And he's working in a team. He's working in a team. He is there, S1, in the team. And he's got boss there. S1, because he has watched his mother submit. Daisy, you are taking another class. I, I, I thought, are you saying something that you are uh, muted and saying? I just wanted to find out. Just clarifying that's all. I am just talking to my husband. That's oh. unintended. I was <laughs> Okay. So, one second, just hold on. Josh, from where you read those definitions, please? This actually, Pastor Josh shared uh, last Thursday night, just after the class. Maybe I'll forward it again, just after the... No, 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 no don't share it again. I will check. Okay. okay. Yeah, so on the WhatsApp. Okay. Uh, just around uh, the time the attendance was posted, just around That's that time. Okay, so, okay. I'll just check. Daisy is uh, laughing as well. anyway. So S1 goes to uh, Infosys and joins a team. But because he is learned... laughing with my head, Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> so he learns to work in this team well because he submits to his boss or leader. Okay. He has learned LT submission. Now uh, imagine uh, five years passed and S1 becomes the leader and he's got a lot of people working under him because he watched a loving caring leadership he serves all of his people in the same way his father took care of his mother can you see the beauty of this now he gets married what does he do? That's the same thing that he saw his father doing in whatever he's done at work. So this whole idea of headship model, when if it worked out in, a, in the proper way, when headship works like Christ form of leadership of serving caring leadership it is uh, amazingly it can work how a generation will learn leadership and submission now we took a son what about a daughter are you sure pastor that he will learn submission from the mother why i'm, I'm asking are you sure absolutely okay Submission is a loving submission to a very caring, serving person. Now, okay, let's take B1. I'm just arguing. This is it's an experiment, okay? I'm just yes. thinking through. I think it's a very perfect example, Pastor. <laughs> I know. I'm just telling you. Okay. Now, you come to daughter. What does a daughter do? Daughter also joins Infosys. <laughs> not, not, we consider two conditions, housewife, we consider Infosys also. What do you think? Isn't that a good experiment? Because these are the two options for a woman, right? Now, Infosys, she goes and joins a, uh, Infosys and is now, uh, D1 is now part of the team. D1 is part of the team, has a boss. Now, 
B1 submits to her she boss. She will either submit to the boss or the husband. Submit to the boss. Boss. Let's say that. I mean, like uh, S1 did. Now, D1, after a couple of years, becomes the head of the team. D1 leads the team. D1 learns from her father of loving, caring leadership and takes care of the team like Jesus would love them and care for them. Does that make sense? Now, let's consider housewife. Now, she gets married. Okay? She gets married. She's not a housewife. This D1 Infosys coder gets married. What does she do? Now this, S1, now, this S1 is from another family. Let's say D1 is from another family. Two loving families, uh, Christ-centered, Bible-based, uh, spirit-filled families, okay? Why is my eraser not working? Okay. I'm just making you all think through this, okay? So S1 marries D1, okay? Uh, Pastor Sindipin is considered uh, marrying S1 and D1. Okay, it's a marriage. Now, S1 is trained to lead and trained to submit also. D1 is also trained to lead and submit because they have visualized in the family both of these things. There is no problem. So technically, there is mutual submission here and you know mutual care and all of those things. The only problem is now... S1 comes from work. D1 also comes from work. Now, who cooks is the question. D1. The maid. Okay. Fantastic idea. Now, if we are all they, able to work. If they both are working together faster, they'll have enough salary to keep a maid. Exactly. But do all families do that? The mother-in-law will say, hey. No. Correct what you said first. And the Daisy said no. Let's see what Daisy says. Daisy? The same thing, Pastor. The mother-in-law says will say that why. Oh, you, you said mother-in-law said no. Okay. Uh -huh. But it's correct. Now S1 and D1, they love each other, they know how to lead, they know how to submit. Imagine they're complementarian. S1 submits, D1, uh, I mean S1 leads, D1 submits. No problem. They know how to do it fantastically. They know how to do it in love and care, all those things. And S1 says, hey, you are working, I'm working. Let's keep a mate. Don't worry. And everything else, I, we will share it together. Correct? We are okay with that, right? But so not every house, it will be the same situation. What percentage of house does this not happen? Which is not church, uh, Christ-centered, which is not spirit-filled. Yeah. No, but I... But you said, uh, Pastor, they're church-centered and spirit-filled. Then you can't have then, a mother-in-law is like that. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's what I'm trying to say. Suppose, suppose mother-in-law says. That is one option. I'm, I'm giving you conditions and options, okay? Because, now, Pastor, I, because mother-in-law was submissive and she took care of the husband, so, she is expecting the daughter-in-law also to take care of her son, not correct. her husband. That is possible. possible. But ideally, now the husband and wife is working, keep a maid, and the husband and wife shares in all of the roles. Now they have a baby. Now husband, whatever he does, cannot have the baby. It only can be, unless of course you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, D1 has to bear the baby. So D1 now takes uh, confinement, and just uh, what did the S1 do? Only deposited the seed, nothing else. D S and S1 is now supposed to take care of D1 during this whole process. So there comes serving leadership, and the D1 is now you know taken care of really well. The baby comes now. Now S1 and D1 had baby one. Now, who will have to feed the baby? D1 has to feed the baby. What? Whatever S1 does, he cannot feed the baby. But of course, today now we... The bottle feed... Uh, Nowadays, pastor, bottle yeah. feed is there. Everyone yeah. has bottle feed. 
correct correct so now now we have solutions for that now s1 also can involve in the uh, bottle feed and uh, fix it wherever is appropriate will baby will you can then feed no problem okay so we are okay now we have solved all submission that you problems now let's come to housewife what happens for housewife she will feed she will clean she will do everything so let's it's now s1 is going for work now this is uh, d2 and s2 uh, s1 and d2 gets married pastor john pastor joseph gets them married okay now d2 is a housewife s1 is a, a working husband what happens there no problem i'll take care of the house you take care of the work and earning one minute hold on So uh, now S1 and D2 gets married. Uh, that's S1 is getting married for the first time. Okay, didn't marry a D1 and then divorce and get married. That's what I wanted. S1 is getting married to D2. D2 is a housewife, and they have a clear division of labor. D2 says, "I'll take care of the home. You take care of work and coming back." Does that sound a good balance? What do you all think? Sorry, I, I depends on how much the S one is bringing home. If he's able to make both ends meet. Okay, I mean we are working. We are working in that model that the S one, whatever they the S one brings, we'll have to deal. We all have to. They have to work within that means. Then it will work faster. It will work. It's a good model. Yes. As long as everything is uh, worked out in grace. Right. Am I? Am I? Am I listening? So. uh if you see the whole uh, headship submission can work can work the only thing is headship should be christ like headship of serving washing the wife seat and all of those things it will no problem at all i mean this whole scheme will work now th th what happens now s1 and d1 goes to church but pastor submission is also not conditional no? like even if headship doesn't work the wife is expected to submit i mean uh, even if the headship doesn't love like christ loves yeah yeah and either ways also even if the wife doesn't submit the husband believing husband is called to love the wife exactly that's correct now the problem will come or let's say that i'm not saying problem will be there now s1 and d1 goes to church 
S2 and S, S2 and D, S1 and D2 also goes to church. How will they function? Same way. How? Maybe D2 will have more time to give. Maybe uh, D1 may D1 may not have that much of time to give at church. Maybe S1 will become elder. D1 will support that elder, elder role by hospitality at home and everything. Caring and you know taking care of S1 as he leads. Possible, isn't it? Yeah. Fantastic model. Same thing. S1 goes to church. D2 goes to church. S1 is the elder there. D2 supports that elder. Knowing that that is her role. I have a supportive role as S1 does the leading role. And I'm able to submit to that uh, idea. Because submission is something that is normal to me. Submission is uh, perfectly fine with me. So I don't see any problem in the complementary model, in the headship submission model at all. If it is done in grace, if it is done truly Christ-like, it's a fantastic model. The idea of a child learning submission and leadership and how he tomorrow functions as a leader, and sometimes he may not be functioning as a leader. He may be working in a, a submitting role. A man, he also has to submit, right? Now this man goes to church, he has to submit D1 and S1 and D1 goes to church. S1 is an elder, but he has to submit to the chief elder. He also knows submission. He has to submit. But he learns submission because he has seen his wife I and mean his mother truly submit. So in that role, can you see how beautifully the, child, the children are able to... Now, let's take another situation. S1 is driving on a road. Okay. Is coming and it's coming to the signal. S1 has been trained by his mother to submit. He stops at the why? He's trained to submit. He's trained to submit to authority. Because whom did he watch? He watched his mother submit. So therefore, he's, he, it is easy for him to submit to authority. What do you think about these ideas? Does this make sense? Yes. So I just complete uh, I gave full support to the complementary model right now. <laughs> I'm just trying to show that it doesn't matter. The models doesn't matter. It, it is possible to work that way also, provided both the man and the woman are subscribing to that common idea in a community that is possible. And the man is leading like Christ led, willing to give his life for his family, his wife, willing to wash her feet, and the wife, like Christ. Now, we all are saying man should be like Christ. Woman should be like church. No, church is hopeless. Now, woman also should be like Christ only. Am I correct? Does, is, does the Bible subscribe that all men should be Christ-like and women should be uh, church-like? That is one of the angles that come in Ephesians 5. No, it's not true. Church, uh, the man and the woman should be Christ-like. Because... Jesus leads and Jesus submits. And both those things are done by Jesus. If you take Philippians and show how Jesus submitted to the Father, so you can use submission theology and you can do, use headship theology as he leads, how he washed the disciples' feet. And he said, I want you to do like that, likewise. Now a man and a woman, husband and wife coming to the church are also a brother and sister with regard to the church idea, isn't it? In that family, they are also... Uh, there are two in, uh, people, common stakeholders in that uh, in a church. 
so god has asked them to love one another and submit to one another so the, in the in the congregation there is a submission to each other between the husband and wife as to stakeholders isn't it are you able to get what i'm trying to say the the angle i'm coming at so i think that clearly kind of takes away the idea that you know we don't have to break our heads on these models whatever you subscribe to you still need the leadership loving leadership serving leadership of jesus and you need the uh, the graceful submission of uh, jesus to work in our lives if both of these models we are embodying i don't care which model it is it works what do you think yes sir so what is the uh, what is the heart of the thing it is christ likeness and that will solve the issue it doesn't then you don't have model issue at all and you can write a fantastic competency right <laughs> with all the charts and pictures and s1 and d1 and you can build it all up like that now you take that model into the church even even if you have male elders what if they are so loving and caring they are so and their wives are standing with them in the loving and caring of all the other people in the church till the child is 18 the, the wife is teaching the boy child till he is 18 the wife is teaching as mother and as under school teacher after 18 hand over to the elder who will be teaching there is equal participation in the teaching process also right so i i i i, I when i when i mean i we, we created the debate and we created the arguments just to show that there are different ways of looking at it but if a community is subscribing even to any of the views as long as we are christ like in our leadership and leading and in our submission there's absolutely no problem it's which whichever role we take does that make does that this like a kind of seal the issue hey why is everybody quiet this was this was a good uh, illustration actually made a lot of sense yeah right very good illustration the only problem arises the wife becomes the boss in the work area why pastor it is no problem at all in the work, work in the work area she becomes the boss yeah we have a, we have we didn't consider that no when a lady who has watched a loving leadership of our is uh, of her father becomes the boss in the team in infosys for example she knows how to lead because she has seen her father lead like christ so she leads like christ that works right sir yeah that's right so ultimately it is christ like us that solves the issue we are to become christ like in our submission in our leading we become but christ but this is a very ideal situation like it's very rare maybe i know carnality and sin actually puts everything into corruption no? yeah. so whichever model you use carnality and sin will destroy it you exactly mm. yeah whether it is complementary or egalitarian or any model i think definitely carnality will yeah. so it is only that the community is subscribing to a model and we follow it as christ likeness then there is no problem at all okay so i mean uh, given that uh, can i can we can, shall we read uh, this because it's brilliant that we read this uh, with the what this guy has done jeff has worked on okay um, and after that we go to uh, elijah and shruti and finish that uh, thing off okay so um, uh, if you all can follow with me because it's foundational for us to understand so where are you reading from us uh, setting in order the household of 38. god yeah 38 yeah okay okay the core concept the passages that seem to most closely express paul's overall intent in writing the pastorals seem to be 1st timothy 3:14 to 16 and titus 1:5 i am writing these things to you hoping to come to you before long 
But in case I'm delayed, I write to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of truth. Okay. For, a, for this reason, I have left you in Crete that you may set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city. So those would be your t- t- two key words that you, statements or scripture that you would use to the fact, the idea that there is the concept of order in the church. How you got to conduct yourself. There is a way in which you are to behave in the house of God. That's what, can you get, draw that? Then you can also take from Ephesians chapter 3 that Paul was given the revelation of the administration of the mystery, which is the church. So Paul had the revelation of how to go about planting, establishing churches. So those three verses you can take and then, so reasoning, let's look at the reasoning. The phrase, these things, has no clear limitation placed on it. And since he adds, hoping to come to you in case I'm delayed, Paul appears to add weight to the idea that he is placing all that he is writing uh, Timothy in his letter under this purpose. The charge he refers to is 1-3. He starts to address specifically in 2-1 and continues in 2 Timothy. Okay, So let's just look at those verses one more time so that we get this correct. You know, I don't know why my Bible is not going to be we got to get this, okay? I mean, if we get this, then the rest of the course is very, very comfortable. And see, because now Jeff is writing. Jeff, you got Jeff's mind here. Then it's easy for us to work through a lot of what Jeff is trying to say. Uh, and let me just get to Timothy. So we 3, 14 to 16, he talks about, yeah, I hope it'll come to you soon and all those things. And then he comes to the charge he refers, okay, the phrases, the phrase, these things. Now, uh, I'm writing these these things. I'm writing these things. Has no clear limitation placed on it. And since he had hope, adds hoping to come to you, and in case I'm delayed, Paul appears to add weight to the idea that he's placing all that he's writing to Timothy in this letter under this purpose. That means everything that he writes in Timothy is basically telling Timothy, hey, I want you to use what I'm telling right now in setting things in order. And if I'm delayed, I want you to do these things. Are you able to get the idea what he's trying to say? All of us are clear? Does it make sense? Uh, so which verse you're reading? 2-1. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm reading... See, the idea of, uh, you know, in uh, 3.14, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things. What these things? That means everything after that, isn't it? Or before that, whatever he's writing to Timothy, basically everything has to be used for the purpose of establishing order and creating a, 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 a a situation within the church where everyone behaves in a particular way. Are you able to get the idea? So if you study the pastorals, you would get how to set a church in order. Are you get the idea what Paul, uh, this guy is trying to bring? All of us are clear. If you are not, I need to get this cleared for you. Basically, the order of us. What is yeah, so there are, there are two words that you use. Uh, how you ought, how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. What's one? And why is it important that conduct? Because church is belonging to God and it is the pillar and support of truth. That means to say, the world can see truth because the church upholds the truth. And for church to uphold the truth, The members of the church should behave in a particular way. How should they behave is what Timothy gets. is written to Timothy. So Jeff is trying to tell us that, hey, what he's writing. Now he says, the charge he refers, okay, he's placing in the, the charge he refers to in 1.3, 1.3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may be yeah, that you may charge certain persons not to teach a different way. So there is, in that charge, there is the idea of 
not to teach wrong teachings, but that we must teach right teachings so that the household is established and that everybody uh, behaves correctly in the household of God so that the church of the living God will be a pillar and buttress of truth. Does that make sense? And, and to the Cretan and to uh, Titus, he says, uh, I want you to stay back here and put to order, put to order everything. Okay. So let's go forward a little bit. The charge he refers one three. He starts to address specifically in two one and continues. He uh, uh, starts to appeal to one thesis. First of all, then I urge, urge that supplications, prayers, and intercession. And thanksgiving made for all people, for kings and all those, and that we may be. So first of all, so that is the idea I think he's saying there. Uh, then the charge he refers to in one three, he starts to address specifically in two one and continues on to second Timothy. From two one onwards, the idea of setting in order begins. Uh, are we all able to see this? It's important that we see this. Yes. Everybody just give me a, you know, some feedback so I can. So two main points, first, like how to conduct and why is it important to conduct so that, uh, you know, the members of the church behave in a particular order so that they are, uh, you know, they, the world can see the truth. Yeah, because the church has to display is the manifold wisdom of God to the authorities, isn't it? Hmm. So, I mean, I'm connecting all this because uh, some of us who are doing first principles can connect it faster because... These concepts are very much uh, there in the first principles. The word house in the pastorals consistently means household in the sense of a social entity rather than the house in the sense of a physical structure. This is a subject that is continually addressed in each episode. Thus, it seems likely that he is referring to community life, not public worship in a building. Can you see the difference? When you know, when, you know, when we, are, we, are, we are not Paul by using the word household, he is uh, not making it as a church, uh, as an organizational thing, but he's making it as something like a, uh, like a community, uh, how a community would work. In Titus, Paul issues a similar charge to Titus and addresses similar community life and structure issues as those in First Timothy. In tight, uh, when First Timothy 3, 14 to 15 put together with one Titus 1, 5, it appears the letters all generally serve the purpose of encouraging Timothy and Titus to fully establish the community life of the churches under their care according to the instructions given to these letters. The placement of these letters within the context of all Paul's letters serves to complete his task of establishing churches which was an aspect of his stewardship from God, Ephesians 3, 1 to 13, which we talked about. The proper functioning of the community life of the church, and now the implications of this idea, okay? If you are, if you are drawing these concepts from these texts, and if we believe that this is the truth, then there are implications for that. Let's read the implication. The proper functioning of the community life of the church is of vital importance. The church is the pillar and the support of truth. Truth cannot be properly guarded and made visible if we do not pay attention to these truths. They are vital to a local church becoming established and effective in the progress of the gospel. Now, if you don't set a church in order, and if the people in the church do not behave according to what the apostles are teaching, they do not conduct themselves, then the church cannot present the truth to the the community, the outside community, therefore not able to express the gospel. Amazing, isn't it? Okay. The ordering of community life is not simply a matter of personal preference. For a community to function as a harmonious unit, it must have order. Each individual must understand his or her part in that order. We cannot expect to have order and harmony in our individual lives our family life and the life of our church if we ignore these principles. These three letters climax the letters of Paul and complete his teaching on the life of the church 
leaving us with all essential norms and guides necessary to see churches in the 21st century become fully established. No church can call itself an established church, a New Testament church, if it fails to order in community life according to these truths. Man, that I think is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> that statement is too powerful. He says that, he, let me repeat this, no church can call itself an established church, a New Testament church, if it fails to order its community life according to these truths. It is important to clearly understand and stand firm in the New Testament guidelines as we attempt to order local churches for their participation in the progress of the gospel today. This becomes especially important since we live in a culture and an era of church history when in most cases local churches regard church polity as a matter of preference. We must also guard against judgmental attitudes, pride, and one upmanship while challenging churches to take these truths seriously, keeping the tension between a focus on being accurate and a focus on the mission set before us. Let me re re read that again. It is important to clearly understand and stand firm in the New Testament guidelines as we attempt to order local churches for their participation in the progress of the gospel today. This becomes especially important since we live in a culture and an era of church history when in most cases, local churches regard church polity, that is leadership, as a matter of preference. We must also guard against judgmental attitudes, pride and one-upmanship while challenging churches to take these truths seriously, keeping the tension between a focus on the accurate and a focus on the mission set before us. In becoming established as a church, setting in order what remains must be priority for leaders if we expect it to be an effective witness in the community and a base for penetrating communities and nations beyond. Central to any world evangelization goal must be the establishing of churches around the world. It was central to Paul's expansion strategy. The establishing strategy was central to Paul's expansion strategy. Can you see the, the beauty of it? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the stakes are high. Many men around Paul deserted him and their faith. Many of the churches faltered. These truths contain a crucial message for the church of the 21st century that is serious about participating effectively on the front lines of the progress of the gospel. These universal truths must be adhered and to and carefully worked out in all cultures and in all times. So roles and responsibilities according to the household test. Within the household of God, ministers of the gospel, elders, deacons, women who are assisted. Okay, so let's take those roles one by one, okay? Ministers of the gospel, pay close attention to their own lives and teaching. Disciplining themselves, and he's taking from Timothy, okay? Disciplining themselves for the purpose of godliness that their progress may be evident to all, work hard as farmers, be disciplined as athletes, and be as unentangled in civilian life as soldiers. Brilliant, isn't it? And he's taking it all from Timothy, because in Timothy, he is telling us how to establish the church. So pay attention to, so he's talking about the leaders. Preach the word in season and out, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, as well as guard against doctrines of demons, refute those who contradict. Be devoted to establishing churches, setting in order what remains, as well as teaching and preaching the truths of how a church, a household of God, ought to conduct itself with the view of keeping the churches on course. Titus, Timothy, and give priority to training leaders, elders and faithful young Timothys to whom they can pass on the deposit. Be vitally involved in recognizing and appointing leaders as well as initiating necessary confrontation of elders who are sinning. All of that is there. In this thing. Be available to minister in other parts of the world as God opens doors and confirms direction through the leaders he has placed over them. This should primarily mean taking the gospel to new areas and establishing new churches or further established existing churches. So he takes from Acts, Philemon, Philemon, wherever he takes time, Timothy, Titus also is there. 
So that is ministers of the gospel. Now let's take elders. Manage the church to which they have been entrusted, shepherding and caring for the believers, being careful not to lord it over them, but rather seeking to keep an example in family and community life and in character. All of it taken. Be skillful handlers of the world and use it to protect the church by refuting sound doctrine, uh, refuting in sound doctrine as well as refuting those who contradict. Be vitally involved in the development, recognizing and commending of young ministers of the gospel as their lives and attested gifts evident as well as appointing new elders and deacons. So uh, the elder also finds out if any of them have got an apostolic bent and can move them into the ministers of the gospel role. They are basically apostolic. The fivefold ministries are involved in the ministers of the gospel. Okay, when it is mentioned ministers of the gospel, you will study in leaders later that Jeff refers to the fivefold ministries. So, when he, as an elder, I need to also keep observing if any of my leaders under me have got a, a fivefold ministry apostolic bend, then I need to move them into that calling. Okay, so he, we need to identify that also. Okay, uh, deacons serve the church being faithful to carry out responsibilities entrusted to them by the elders, recognizing that at times they will be given special tasks of meeting community-wide needs and finding solutions to problems which demands faithfulness and not being double-tongued. All of it is taken from Timothy 3, 8 to 13 and Acts 6, 1, 6. Be clear in the understanding of the faith, living consistently with the truth, especially in ordering their lives and families according to uh, with the God's plan for the age. Women who assist elders and deacons. Serve the church, being fruitful to carry out the responsibility entrusted to them, being careful to be accountable to the elders and deacons. Be careful to remain exemplary in character and avoid allowing difficult situations in which they find themselves to lead to gossip. Pastor, I, I'll just mute you because sound is very high from that. Older women. Set an example of respectful behavior in Older life of... Men. I'm sorry, older men. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Set an example of faithfulness and perseverance within the church. Continue on in the faith and remain sound in it, growing in the word and modeling the living of a, of a life that is ordered under the principle so the community might be strengthened as it relates as an extended family. Older women, set an example of respectful behavior in the community, evidently both toward the leaders of the church as well as for younger women towards their husbands and family responsibilities. Continue to be devoted to good works, using their homes for meeting needs in the church and in the world. It's a brilliant thing. Anything they teach must have soundness to that is marked by good works and is built around assisting the younger women to properly orient themselves to godly living within their homes and within the household of God. It was the older woman. Now, the younger women be devoted to their husbands and children and to laboring hard to make their homes a powerful witness to the beauty of the word of God. Be known, to, known for good deeds by using their homes as a base for meeting the needs in the believing community and in the community at large, as well as assisting those in distress. Younger men seek to show themselves as examples of good deeds, watching their speech so as to not get caught in youthful lusts, which is so often tied together with speech. Labor to become established in the sound, sound in their faith. Widows. Younger widows should seek to remarry and invest in the types of responsibility listed above for younger women. Older widows should seek to devote themselves fully to the needs of the household of faith, even to the extent of being supported if they are in need and their children cannot support them. Now, within the individual households, husbands and fathers, assume responsibility for the management, provision, and care for their households, leading their households to function effectively and harmoniously with the household of God. Love their wives as Christ loves the church, honoring and cherishing them, that they might mature into the image of Christ without spot or wrinkle. Bring up the children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, being careful not to be too harsh or overcorrective, causing them to be exasperated and lose heart. Wives and mothers, Assist their husbands by being devoted to them and the children, working hard to make their homes under their husband's leadership a powerful witness to the beauty of the word of God. Place themselves under the headship of their husbands, putting on gentle, non-challenging, 
spirits which is precious in the sight of God. Assist their husband in bringing up the children, loving them and caring for them. Children, obey their parents, keep their lives under the direction and control of their parents as they grow, as well as staying on the life course as their parents taught them from the scriptures and set them on. Honor their parents even to the extent of making some return to them as they are older, including completely providing for their widowed mothers if needed. What do you think? Does this isn't this good to teach uh, in church? This whole the whole framework. Yes. So, Pastor, we also have to write like this. Um, you can use this way and write it if you so want. What to more it. can we add or what can we remove? No, you, you don't need to, you do not need to, need to follow the same example. But you can you can have you have an idea of what he's thinking, isn't it? What is he looking at? But pastor, same verses only, you know, like no session, problem, no Titus, problem. Timothy, then you will yeah. say we copied. No, no, no. no that, I, I have a voice to pass your voice. <laughs> <laughs> no, so it, it's not like that. But why I made you read it is it's more than just writing the competency. I think we are all involved in the business of church, and we need to know how to. Um, what do you say? We need to know how to um, get this done right. One second, hold on. So, uh, competency 3 says, develop a basic biblical understanding of the philosophy that is to drive the ministry of the church and the instructions that is the house order by which each local church is to abide. Now, he has written so much. We don't need to write that much. But you can build it now. So you've got a framework what he's talking about. You can build it on your own. The idea of order, the idea of Paul having the view of doing this because he was given to him as a, this thing. Uh, and the idea of uh, house, uh, church is a family, church is a household, and that uh, the, the, this household is made up of many families. Uh, and each family has a structure. And we need to see that each of those families are established very well. And then uh, that the church itself is established very well with, uh, you know, uh, philosophies, uh, biblical philosophies, and underlining, underlying all of these structures. Does that, does that hold? I mean, we can write a lot right now, isn't it? We can really but, build on this. Yeah. I, you know, past, as I was reading, I was thinking, you know, at least in the 20th century, we cannot make it gender-based. A lot of things. Like when we are, see here also young, younger men, He's written labor to become established and sound in their faith. That even women have to do. Another but, thing is watching their speech so as to not get caught in youthful lust. Today, women and young women and men are exposed to these things. Agree, agree, agree. So, right, you can write that. You can say in the 20, Paul was writing in the uh, somewhere in AD this thing, but today many of these issues have changed, and we need to address this both in both of these. Okay. The idea is you can write that. You can interact with the authors. You can interact with uh, the Paul. You can interact with uh, the all the other fellows, wherever they are appropriate. Interact with them and write your thoughts. But Nothing I, is told for widowers also, Pastor. I don't know why. I'm, I'm just looking at this and thinking. Yeah, because at that time, uh, um, I mean, it's a cultural issue at that time. I remember you mentioning it. You yeah. had told you had yeah. told something about this long back. Yeah. I forgot. Yeah, yeah. So I know that I will get into another argument, so I will not get into that. <laughs> we'll, so let us. I mean, we got the picture right now. We got uh, the idea of what Paul is trying to say there, and we know what we are supposed to write. Develop a biblical understanding of the philosophy that is to drive the ministry of the Church of God. The philosophy is the idea that church is a family. How do you get that idea? The household of God idea. You can take it from Ephesians. You can take it from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 uh, and verses 14 to 16. 
you can use all of those ideas to build that biblical theology and that the philosophy is uh, church as a family and the instructions that is the house order by which each local church is to abide so then you need to look at both the household codes the, the individual household codes and the uh, extensive uh, the family house the, the corporate household codes and you build that on that which is what he has done and you can in, you can argue many of those things so like for example i argued you cannot read efficiency the way that you are seeing it there because for it was not an original pauline idea i think uh, stephen clark or somebody has written about that very clearly i think it's stephen clark or i don't know werner one of them has written about the idea that this particular station code schema is not an original pauline idea so paul was not writing some unique theology for the church there that there are these three station husband wife father son my master that station code schema was there in the greco roman literature he uh, takes it from there and he builds puts the gospel into it and brings it into proper balance which you need to write you want to bash up stephen clark you want to support stephen clark no problem it's up to you you can use it anyway i bashed up stephen clark i bashed up all of those fellows i gave my own views and my build my biblical theology you are free to do that okay that's up to you but you feel stephen clark is good his ideas are good his not will you right, you use that and interact with it hey yeah, did we lose robin yes for sitting sometime uh, raja can you just check what happened to robin I mean, because we're going to present now you both are going to present okay so i'm going to stop here and uh, i thought of doing the socratic discussion also but we will do it after uh shruti and raja presents i uh, you got you guys got short time i'm sorry uh, i've taken away your time it's a short article as well so it's okay so one second i'm going to give you sharing rights one second yeah but what do you think i mean i i the more i study paul and, the, and that's the way we look at the text today i think it's so brilliant uh, the spirit the holy spirit's uh idea of of establishing communities it's beautiful isn't it it's so wonderful and that was the secret of the progress of the gospel okay shruti and raja you're on yes Okay. Yes. So uh, this uh, the article that we are looking at today is uh, community as a family. This is written by Robert Banks. Uh, before we go ahead, just quickly summarizing our units. So we have five units. We have seen unit one, two, Paul's concept of establishing churches. form and freedom uh, a new testament church is uh, uh, unit 3 we are looking setting in order that is the concept of household within the household of god which is having two issues false job description and order in the household of god unit 4 is additional guidelines for the household in which is one issue household guideline unit 5 is finally establishing churches in the 21st century so this uh, the two articles that we are reading uh, they are chapter 5 and chapter 6 from robert banks uh, book paul's idea of community and they are referenced in all these three issues uh, unit 3 which we are discussing and in which issue 2 the project uh, topic is this write an annotated summary of the relationships and responsibilities of each group listed in the household text which is basically what we read today Uh, the 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 model uh, solution given by jeffrey categorize them at, according to both individual households a family and the household of god and local church follow paul's categories within those groups for families husband wives parents children slaves for churches minister of the gospel elders deacons older men older women younger women and younger men and women who assist deacons and widows our socratic discussion questions are what are the key social relationships within the home 
what are the primary responsibilities of each what are the key social relationships within the church what are the responsibilities of each uh, what implications for managing the church arise from viewing the home as a household within a larger household how might these concepts affect our understanding of the church order and authority our ministry strategies our concept of counseling and discipline in the church our shepherding strategies in the church so everything is uh, or at least uh, the key is everything is linked to how the church is ordered uh robert banks looks like this uh he was born in 1937 something so it's pretty old right now uh he is a senior research and development fellow in the center of history of christian thought and experience in in somewhere in sydney australia uh and he has written a lot of books so this book is actually written by him and co-authored by his wife so uh coming to coming to the topic uh this is more specific to what we are studying uh it starts with what are the metaphors for community used by used by paul so the local church is uh is uh, or paul is using several metaphors he's using the metaphor of a building uh, describing that the way the local church is formed we are we are different blocks in a building and we hold the structure together paul also uses the local church uh demonstrated as the temple so generally he uses the metaphor of temple when he wants to show the the divine human relationship so relationship between god and humans then he uses the temple as the metaphor uh when he is using the temple as a metaphor he uses the cornerstone uh, represented by christ so he is the, the the solid rock the foundation stone on which we stand and in this metaphor he then calls himself the the master builder he uses several other metaphors for local church like a field uh, or uh, a plant that is grafted into the olive tree so this is specifically i think the gentiles being grafted into the jewish community uh, he also uses the metaphor of planting so taking a seed and planting it and how it grows that's as the metaphor for the local church he uses the dough as the metaphor for the local church and sometimes the leaven as as uh, people who are offenders within the church he also uses the body as a metaphor for the church so this is we'll be expanding on this fully on on the next article okay, uh, how body is used as a metaphor for the community uh due to basically so all these metaphors that we saw all of them lacked the dynamic nature okay so building temple uh, or fields they are not dynamic in nature or they don't have moving parts with ideas that change and so on so uh none of his metaphors can you know completely describe the relationship relationship that is why you know paul you would see he will mix and match metaphors sometimes he will talk take elements from the building suddenly he will move towards uh, uh, agriculture and use examples from them because he wants to bring that dynamic he also uses a metaphor for community which is the family okay and this is uh, or robert back says that this is a really good metaphor and he will devote this entire chapter on this how the family can become the metaphor that describes the functioning of the local church okay and he says that uh, the family metaphor is really key because uh, it, it is something that is drawn upon in all of paul's writings uh, the greek word uh, that is used for family is oikos uh, which is belonging to the household belonging to the household now uh, so let's get deeper into how how is family the key image okay and he talks two aspects here uh, one is description of the membership and then uh, the second aspect is uh, the quality of the membership so we take uh, some some quotes in galatians 4 i'll read them verse 4 5 6 and 7 but when the fullness of the time had come god had sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the that we might receive the adoption as sons and because you are sons god has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying out abba father therefore you are no longer a slave but a son and if a son then an heir of of god through christ so the idea here is uh, the key image of family to describe the to describe the the local church paul takes from the description of god being the head 
and the children uh, as uh, all of his followers Christians being as sons. So the, the, the family as a metaphor is not only for the local church, but also for the relationship between God and all believers as Christians. So when we look at this kind of a metaphor, the relation between God and Christians as a family, uh, Robert uh, Banks is saying that this is not a relation like between king and his and his courts, courts. Okay, the relationship between monarchy and the court is not the relationship that is described here. It is also not a relationship like master and slaves, and it is also not a relationship like between uh, between a father or parents and infants. Okay, rather the relationship that is being described here is basically that of uh, is basically that of uh, uh, parents and adult children. Okay, so children that those are not totally infants, but they they are mature enough to to have a relate intimate relationship with the with, with the parents. Okay, so here uh, it's like uh, you have young adults who can understand what's going on and relate and become intimate with them. So that's that's the kind of relationship that is being described in the writings of Paul, or at least that is what Robert Banton is specifying. As we go ahead uh, in the description of membership, uh, Galatians six ten says, "Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are in the household of faith." Okay. So here again, uh, uh, the key image of the family is being shown as a local church. So because you are part of, uh, or you know, I'm, I'm not going too much into the context of uh, just before Galatians 6, what happened, but it says, now that we are into this family, let's let's look for opportunities to, to, good, to do good between this community, okay? So some kind of familial relationship within the household of God. Uh, Ephesians 2 says, uh, 19 verse onwards, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the house of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fit together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are, you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Okay. So here, here again, uh, uh, the key image or the key metaphor uh, recognizing that we are now part of the household of God. We are now members of, 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 this, of this community together. Okay? That's like the description of the membership. Uh, further, uh, what words are used? So Paul uh, uh, primarily uses this word Adelphoi, which is translated as brethren. Okay? So you would see, at least in the writings of Paul, he'll say, dear brothers, or he will address our beloved brother and so on. So he will use these kind of addresses quite often within his writings. Now, what has happened is, at least for us, when we read brothers, it has become a more formal term showing that he's writing to Christians. But Robert Banks is suggesting that it's not just a, a mere formal description, but it is an expression of real relationships which Paul harbored between the Christians. Okay, And that relationship is being represented in his writing. So for example, when you read from 1 Corinthians, uh, so like first Corinthians, we know uh, uh, it, it, it's talking about, you know, uh, different issues in the church, uh, let's say um, meat eating and, and things like that. So where, uh, uh, in that issue, Paul mentions that uh, be concerned for each other. He says like, even if you don't have to, so, so he says eating meat is not a problem. That's okay. But because you love your neighbor, because you love your brother who is weaker in faith, you would not eat meat. Uh, that that would destroy his faith. Okay. So here he's talking about a strong concern between two two members of the same household. Okay. So something like a family. Uh, in First Corinthians eight eleven he says, and because of your knowledge, uh, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Again, so the relationship he's mentioned is so. Uh, in the normal sense, you would think, okay, what? Why do I care if someone else loses salvation? Okay. But Paul is is drawing out this idea that you should be really caring about your weak brother because Jesus, he, he died on the cross for him. Okay. And because you love this brother, you should, you should, you know, uh, constrain and become more mature and not, not cause them to stumble and things like that. 
in Colossians 4:7, uh, he's talking to Tychicus. Uh, he's talking about Tychicus, through which so Tychicus is basically the the emanuensis through which he sends the letter to the church in Colossae. He says, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. So we can see in his writing, he, he's writing a beloved brother. So he treats Tychicus as a family member, as a brother who's you know who he cares about and deeply is affectionate about. In, he mentions the same regarding Sosithenes, Apollos, and Quartus in these writings. He mentions them as brothers. Okay? In Philemon 7, he says, For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Okay. So uh, uh, what uh, Robert Banks is highlighting on is when Paul writes brothers and things like that, when he uses the word Adelphoi, it is not out of you know mere uh, formal description. But he has true love and bonding uh, and relationship between these people as belonging to the household of God. And that is the reason why he's writing this. Okay. We go ahead. Uh, it is not uh, the word uh, Adelphoi. Uh, uh, it is not the only word that represents brethren. But he represents the same familiar relationship like a son or like sisters uh, in his writings. Okay? So for example, Philemon 10 and Colossians 4.9, he's talking about Onesimus as my child whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Okay. So he has, uh, while he was in prison, he had this relationship with Onesimus and he treats him as a child and, and Onesimus treats him as a father. Okay. Similarly to Timothy, he says, I have no one like him. How a son with his father has, he has served me in the gospel. Okay. Uh, two sisters, he writes, Afia, our sister, or our sister Phoebe, a helper of many and of myself as well. Uh, to, to Rufus, he says in, in Romans 16, 3, greet Rufus and also his mother and mine. So he's talking about Rufus's mother as, as his own mother. Okay. So here we, throughout the writings of Paul, so these are a few examples, but we, if we scan through the writings of Paul, we can see so many analogies which is drawn from family life. Uh, he's talking about fathers, mothers, nursing, and so on. Okay. So the, the family as a metaphor is a key metaphor for Paul to describe the local church. So let's move ahead with what is the quality of this relationship? So when he says family, what is the, what is the relationship that they harbor within this family? Okay. So I, I just took this quote from Robert Bank. He says, local, church, local churches are to enter into the same kinds of loving relationships with one another. Okay. So uh, again, love is the key here. So when we say that we are a family, or when we say that the local church is a metaphor of a family, the key thing that binds all of this together is love that is demonstrated between the members of this family. Okay. So for example, Paul refers as beloved to, to all these guys, Epinetus, Ampliatus, Stachys, Persis, Tychicus, Onesimus, and Luke in these writings. Okay. He says, how I yearn for you all uh, with the affection of Christ. So Paul is writing to the church at Philippians and to the entire church, he's saying that I'm yearning for you all. With the same affection that Christ had. So in to Corinthians, he, write, he writes, My love be with you all. In Thessal he, for Thessalonians, uh, he prays that they increase and abound in love to one another as we do to you. In Romans, he says, Love one another. Finally, uh, of course, when we talk about love, we, we have to go back to 1 Corinthians 13, uh, verses 4 to 8. He says, uh, Love suffers long and is kind, love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not popped up. It does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity. But rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. So here when Paul is writing to the church in Corinthians, he's addressing the idea of love within the local church. Addressing fundamental attitudes of patience, humility, tolerance, kindness, resilience, generosity, confidence, perseverance, optimism, and these relationships between Christian brothers and sisters. So that's basically the, the quality of relationship. So we, we saw uh, what are the metaphors Robert Banks uses, and then the key image of family with two angles. One is what is the description of the membership? And second, uh, what is the description of the membership to this household, uh, which is the family? And the second is what is the quality of this relationship? So is, is this a different idea? Or do we find uh, these uses of family elsewhere other than the writings of the New Testament? Okay. 
So at first instance, we would think that okay, the, the, the idea of family would be really common. Okay, if, if you if you scan through the Old Testament, you would be seeing the idea of family a lot. Okay, so that would be one's intuition. But that is not the case, as Robert Banks says. Okay. In the Old Testament, Israel is not called God's family. Okay, they are not. So even if the relationship of Israel and God is mentioned as son and father, but between the sons, let's say between the land of Israel, the idea of community is not emphasized. They are not, or they are not emphasized of living as a loving family within each other. So Pharisees. So uh, Robert Banks takes some examples between the Greco-Roman world. I have not added those because it, it seemed uh, out of the point. So, if you read through the article, you would see that he has taken a few more examples of, you know, within the Greek world, what are the what is the terminology of family? Again, the idea of the family that does not exist again in the Greek world as well. So, what about Pharisees? So, Pharisees are as Pharisees have a rabbi, and the rabbi are treated as father, right? But even in that case, the relationship is obscured by the law. It is not the same relationship as talked about between between the father and children and wife uh, as Paul writes. So Paul's writing, it is distinguished by his personalization. So he uses words like my love, my beloved, my brother, my sister, my family. Okay? So the word is, is very personal in nature. Uh, he even breaks conventions by referring to sisters as intimately as sons and brothers. Okay. So he makes that, he makes that, uh, 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 he breaks that convention or that order as well by talking to Phoebe or Aphelia and talking about them as, as sisters. Okay. Uh, so where does Paul get this idea? So Robert Banks says Paul did not develop this idea of his own, but he, he gets that idea from Jesus treating his disciples and treating his followers as family members. So here he takes a quote from Mark 3, 34, 45. He says, here are my mother and my brother. Whoever does the will of God is my brother, my sister, and my mother. So Jesus, when talking to his disciples, he has a familial bond. And that is the familial bond that is picked up by Paul in his writings. And that's what the New Testament church uh, followed. Uh, this, is, this is the last, the last slide. Okay. What is the relationship then between family and fellowship? Okay. Family is the word oikinos. Was that the word? Sorry, I just... Oikosis. Oikos, is it? Ah, oikios, oikios. So what is the relationship between this word oikios, family, and koinonia, which is fellowship, which is generally translated as fellowship. So the Greek word koinonia, uh, which is translated generally as fellowship, is not a familial term, but it is frequently translated as fellowship. It uh, generally means joint participation or sharing in something or jointly, you know, gift jointly contribute, a collection or contribution, or being joint heirs. That is what this word is used as. But primarily, uh, when we look within the, within the writings of the New Testament, fellowship and family are in close association. Okay. Why is that? Because he says it had to be that way. Because once uh, in, in uh, push Pentecost, when the, when the church is formed, uh, how, where will they meet? Okay. Uh, they cannot go and meet in the synagogues or they cannot meet in local public temples. Okay? They had to meet in the households of, of uh, the Christians. And this meeting in the households of Christians, which is the fellowship, uh, this provided the conducive atmosphere to express the bond which they had in common. Okay? To express the, the love and care they had for a family. So this is primarily what the article says. It actually does not have a good good end or a conclusion because it's it's part of the chapter and it continues into chapter six which is uh, which is uh, the body uh, the key things to remember for us is, is this okay uh, paul uses the family as a metaphor for for the local church in in fact that is what our whole unit is about setting in order uh, the the individual household and uh, the household of god with with regards to how the individual household functions okay uh, Key questions to ask would be, who would be our spiritual father and what is our relationship with them? And who would be our, our spiritual sons or daughters and how is our relationship with them? And uh, do, we have, do we have members in the church that we call family and not just call family, but relate to them as a family, sharing with one another, caring for one another and depending on one another. I think this is, this is what it is. Uh, directing towards and highlighting towards. So that's that's basically the end of of uh, this. Uh
uh, this article. Elijah, if you uh, you are a pastor of a church. <clears throat> And uh, being a pastor of a church, having read this article, can you tell me what do you feel? What is your feeling? What do you think was, is really turning us on the inside? What Robert Banks is drawing out of what Paul is talking to the church? What is your feeling? I know that the presentation is brilliant. We made it so beautiful and easy for us to understand. But I want to know what, what, what does that do to you? So, uh, maybe uh, okay. I stop presenting in this. Series. So for me, the uh, this is not the first time I'm hearing this idea. Though. So it it is not hitting as hard right now. But uh, it it hit me really hard when we were doing the first principles, especially on, on you know uh, talking about the church as as a family. And uh, that time, so this for me is like the second layer of it, and maybe going deeper. Uh, but it, it's a, it's a, even though it is really evident in the writings of the New Testament, it never hit me hard because probably I never saw it from this paradigm. Uh, Christian life for me would always be about me and my personal relationship with Christ. Uh, how good I'm reading the Bible or if, 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 am I praying enough? Am I fasting enough? But it, even the idea of thinking of you know people within the church as my family or people within, or if I have any role to play in their life, I think that was only for the pastor. And the way the pastor would do it is probably, you know, uh, visit the person once a month and pray for them in the family. So this would be my older Christian paradigm. But when it first hit me within, while doing the first principles, it was uh, shattering uh, because uh, I remember having discussions in the first principles talking about things like, uh, just like in a family, I cannot tell Shruti that I, you know, I, tomorrow I am leaving for the Himalayas and I'll return after 18 months or no hope of I'll returning. Uh, we do that with the church always, especially in our setup, right? Where people move quite often uh, without even regards of thinking, will, will that affect the church uh, or will it change things? Because we never have that bond with the church. It's, it's an institution. You come, you attend, uh, you, spend your, you spend your time and while you're spending your time, you do whatever requires maybe wiping the seats and so on. But when you get a better opportunity, you just jump and you, you, you bail. Uh, this was the norm, right? But when it first hit me that I cannot do the same with my family, and if I cannot do the same with my family, then when I read within the writings of the New Testament, brothers and sisters within the church, uh, what the hell am I doing, right? I am, I am totally unaware of or ignorant of the fact that the family uh, is the family relationships is maintained in the church. So now uh, with regards to like with, with the role of being a pastor of the church, this hits even more hard because uh, uh, it, it's very easy to say that, you know, the members within the church are my family and it is, uh, I don't know, extremely impossible or difficult to even realize what does it mean and what, what are the implications of that? And we are starting to do that now. So we are starting to actually enter into that shoes and saying that if someone within the church is struggling, uh, maybe with finances or 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 with you know relationship struggles, that actually is not only his problem; it is my problem as well. And this realization would never come. Like I've been in church twenty years, thirty years, it would never come. Only last two years we have started to think in those terms. That it it hurts me when people in the church are hurt. Uh, and uh, I, I think this teaching is what draws this out, which means that we have a greater and far more responsibility than I ever thought the pastor has. It is not just to you know be on time on Sundays and see that Sundays function, but it is also to see that the the, the families within the church are ordered, and maybe they are not ordered because they don't know about it. And then it means that I we would have to teach them in the church and build up leaders in a such a way that this idea becomes the norm. And we transform in a way that we truly become the truth and buttress of the gospel. Otherwise, we end up becoming uh, audience within the church, do our time and then move on as, as you know, other bigger, better opportunities come. We just do our time and move ahead, wait till, till Christ comes and then go to heaven. Okay. Uh, it becomes really... It becomes really boring or in one sense, there's no mission, right? There's no plan. But now when you align ourselves with 
what Christ is doing and understand his mission and understand his plan, then we, can, we cannot be like lazy soldiers at the guard post. But we need to be alert and walking around and seeing that, that, that our soldiers are fit and they don't have flabby stomachs or are not prepared with the weapons, right? We need to, so that changes everything in fact. That changes how we do church. Thank you. Uh, that, that was really, really meaningful. Your, uh, your, uh, your, the impact that it has upon you. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Shruti, are you on? Ready? Next. Present again. The next article written, written by Robert Banks, yes. the continuation of this is the community as a body. So here we will see that how Paul was using a church as a church as a body, means in which sense he was using. So when we read 1 Corinthians 6.15, there it says that do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? So here Paul is trying to say that we all together, means the whole church, are the different organs or are the different parts of Christ. Then again in 1 Corinthians 10, 17, we see the reference that there is since there is one bread, we believers who are many are united into one body. So here also again, the unity which is there in the community is highlighted or is showed uh, is shown in spite of the there being many members or multiple people all coming from various backgrounds, having different mindsets, ambitions, and all those. Then when we go further, we see also in 1 Corinthians 11, 29. So usually 1 Corinthians 11, uh, chapter verse 20, and even next uh, 33. This is usually taken while we do the communion. So here it says, anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So here again, when Paul is referring to body, so he is referring to the church community. Then in 1 Corinthians 11, 33, it says, so then my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. So here, even as Elijah told uh, that there was a problem in the church of Corinth, and also while they used to come to the Lord's table for the supper. So he had scolded them once that you just don't eat like gluttons, but you have to wait for everyone else also. And so that the meal is shared with everyone. So here again, what Paul is trying to bring out is we are the com whole community is a body. So no individualistic attitudes or cliche formation is allowed, but everything has to be done in unison all together. And also when Paul is uh, denoting the church community as a body, he says uh, that community and even human body, he is forming in allegorical, uh, allegory he is showing and in parabolic form he is showing. So he is showing that human, be, uh, human society, church and the whole body is uh, represented symbolically. They have certain similarities. So while we read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 30, so there again in verse 27, Paul quotes that now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. So here when he is uh, looking at the church, when he is looking at the local community at Corinth, he is telling that each one together make Christ's body and each, mem each person who comes to the church, they all are individual members of the school, total Christ's body. That is the church. Again, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 also, Paul says that for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. So again, the reason why we all are one or why there is unity, why we all uh, church goers or uh, disciples of Christ are one body, the reason being is that Christ is present in each one of us in spirit. So because of one spirit in which we believe, and hence wherever a group of Christ followers gather, it is called as a body, just because of the common spirit which each one has, though we are gathering here in India or anywhere abroad also. 
then again your paul uh, teaches uh, or paul is explaining to us that how while in a community there are different people in a church there are different people so there is ministry towards means each one has a role to play for other members of the community like for example in the church if there are people who are uh, good in teaching so they can be a part of children's club or youth adda so they will be doing their ministry towards other people of the community same way there are people who help in just cleaning the chairs and setting up the things so that is one kind of ministry towards other members of community and also uh, secondly he says that each member has a unique role to play okay so just a few days ago there was a message that we need to we all need to come to church because sitting at sitting on the sofa at our home we can't serve the lord so everyone in the church has got a role to play so in the church we go to encourage others uh, and also to give uh, encouragement and motivation to others and hence here paul again reminds and tells to the church at corinth and in general to all that everyone has got a unique role to play which he or she only can play and hence everyone is important and then also he encourages uh, that people who do less obviously spectacular services also are to be applauded otherwise every time on the limelight or in the front are always the leaders and the people who are at the podium who are sharing the communion or sharing the work but and even in the vbs now in the front or on the screen will be all the children and all the volunteers of those particular day but we should not forget that there are many people who are working at the background to make the show a success okay so everyone has to be um, everyone has to be given uh, the due uh, the do what we say appreciation in the whole body that is in the whole community of church and then they uh, paul also tells that as it is one body so the relationship between just as the relationship between family members and people is thick okay similarly the link between the members is close like this happens with me i do not know much about my relatives as much as i know about the church people okay because the link is close because we meet every sunday and then other than that also we uh, are meeting up at different avenues so here this is what paul is trying to bring out that we are just not family or we are not just friends for name sake or not just for putting things on the social media oh today i went here with my church and i just post now but the link is close or the relationship is a thicker one and also paul brings out the unity which is there because of one common spirit that is given to each one of christ followers then again he goes to romans 12:4 and uh, again from romans and corinthians he brings out that though there is diversity in the church because especially in a city setup where uh, in a city like bangalore where people come from different corners of the country and even from other countries for work so here there is unity in diversity when people come into the church they come from different culture their uh, patterns will be different but still in a church we'll see a whole diverse group which is functioning in peace and harmony and unity no doubt there will be some ups and downs and highs and lows but still uh, paul is encouraging the calling the whole church as a community and body because in the church though there is diversity but there is unity and also uh, paul is reminding through romans 12 6 that in the church when there are different people the whole body relates to the exercise of gifts so all those gifts and talents which are given to different people those all are to be uh, church is a place where all these gifts can be exercised and hence others can be uplifted and encouraged and the church can get going still forward then again uh, paul reminds about church being a body through 1 corinthians 12 5 where he says that we all are united only because of christ we all call each other brothers and sisters because of the common a uh, link and the common reason that is christ and his spirit had there been no christ uh, then we would have definitely not gathered in church and definitely we would have not celebrated also his resurrection that is only because of jesus christ 
and all that he has done we all are united and also while paul is uh, now all these metaphors we saw in uh, there were metaphors given through romans and the corinthians now also paul is using a uh, church as a body in colossians so while he uses it in colossians so he says in colossians 116 that jesus christ is above all the created things above all the visible and invisible things that we see around us and also uh, in colossians 119 and 20 when we read that beautiful poem which was written about christ so here it is uh, it says that christ is above all the uh, cosmic powers and also in 118 christ is the head and all the believers uh, of the church or wherever the believers are gathering together that is believers is the whole body and christ is the head of this whole body and even while we read colossians chapter 2 verses 19 and 20 there also we come to know that how uh, all the body organs are to be knit together so that everyone would be getting nourishment and through joints and ligaments so just as in a body like for uh, there is a very uh, good story so which teaches that in a body every organ is important and nothing can just function individually like for example if my head is aching so my whole body will be facing this trouble i cannot just tell my head oh you stop aching or i cannot just remove this organ and keep it aside okay let it get healed and then i take it back and then i do my normal work so when we say church as a body and even uh, church as a family means if at all one part is aching or one part is having any discomfort or is uh, restless automatically the whole body will start uh, facing the pain and discomfort and start being restless so what paul is trying to bring out is let there be unity amongst each one and let everyone take care of uh, let everyone take care of the other person in the church and whatever things are being done let everything be done in love and just to uplift others and also when we read from colossians 3:15 so there also it just says that uh, all the members of the church are just called as one body so by just mentioning this so many times robert bank is just trying to emphasize that how uh, the unity works together and how because of this one person christ and his spirit everyone is united and just everything functions so harmoniously and again when we see in the letter to the church at ephesians also there also in ephesians 121 uh, paul is telling that jesus christ is far above all and we all are just uh, organs different organs of the same body and of which christ is the head same thing is mentioned in uh, ephesians 122 23 and even in ephesians 4 4 5 23 23 so on and so forth. then again in uh ephesians 216 and 36 here it shows the unity between the jews and gentiles just as the uh, mystery of the household of the household rules are revealed so now when even when we read in the book of colossians that now there is no difference between the jews and gentiles okay we all are coming from the gentile background because we all are not jews not from jewish community and but here Christ is for everyone. Means He gave His sacrifice for everyone, and while we are uh, Christ followers, we all are just united, be it Jews or Gentiles, in the context what Paul has given. And the current context, we can take it as though we are belonging to any one of the twenty-nine states of India, or though we are from, though there are people from other countries also, but we all are just one body in Christ. And also, while we read. Uh, in Ephesians one twelve and fifteen to sixteen, and even in three fifteen, so here also it says the same thing. Here also it says that God has loved each one unconditionally. Ah, huh, so here when we see it's given on reader two twenty seven page. so here also what paul is encouraging just as the body grows up okay uh, and uh, the 
it employs a stark image of the body growing up into the head and suggests that the conformity of the church to Christ should become ever more complete. The final references to the metaphor in this letter occur in the list of obligations for husbands and wives. Here again, Christ is spoken of as the head of the church, his body, and Christians as members of his body. So whatever is even taught in Ephesians 5.23, how husband need to be the head of the household and wives need to submit. So there also everything is correlated just as how church is to Jesus Christ. Christ is the head and the church submits to Christ. Similarly, wives also need to submit to their head, that is the husband. Then we also see that how it further got developed. So how this metaphor of church being a body. So Ecclesia, we also saw that when the terms body and church occur together in Ephesians, it refers to the church, his body. So even while we read Ephesians 2.18 and even in Ephesians uh, chapter 2 verse 22 and even in chapter 4 verses 3 to 4, here it is just shown that how the whole community is forming the whole body. It's Christ along with each and every people who is a Christ follower or Christ disciple together is called as a body. And then again, while we read Ephesians 4.15, so here what Paul is bringing out is there should be actions, okay? Saying we are one body, it is okay, but here it says that uh, Reader 227, second last paragraph, in talking about the mutual contribution of the members, the emphasis is on the necessity for their corporate growth rather than on the interdependence that follows from this. And that growth is defined as an ever-increasing integration into Christ. So just as uh, in the normal sense also, we rarely we skip our meals. Only while we are fasting, we will not eat. Or else most of the time, even if we are busy, we make sure that we eat. We eat so that our body gets nutrition and it would be able to carry out all the activity as well. And in the case of small children, we feed them all nutritious, healthy food as much as we can do so that their body grows well. So similarly here, while Paul is addressing that church is a body and all the other people who need to exercise their gifts. So these gifts, while they are exercising, so it is for helping each other to grow. Okay, and these gifts are not being exercised so that people be dependent on others, but the reason always is to spur them to grow further by counseling them, by teaching them and by guiding them. And again, while we see the next, nextly we see what all are the limits, like we Elijah told that uh, Paul was not able to get any one particular dynamic uh, metaphor to compare church to and hence he talks about it being a family he compares it with planting grafting and also while we hear in this article while robert banks is comparing church to a body so he says uh, that what is the limitation so here the limitation what paul brings out is that your interaction of members of the church is always with one another nor with outsiders okay uh, so while we re, uh, read from Reader 228 page, so here it says, uh, Reader 228 second paragraph, this does not mean that individual members of the community or group of members lack responsibilities towards the world around them. So here what Paul is trying to bring out is each member of the church means each organ of the body each believer has got certain responsibilities towards each other towards the member who are in the church like for example someone does not turn up so we just call and ask or send a whatsapp message why didn't you come okay is everything all right on so that is interaction which we do with the members of the church but here paul is also telling that yes church is also always outward looking church also need to interact with other people and henceforth the gospel will go out and fulfillment of the great commission will take place and then again he speaks about the application of this metaphor of church being a body so uh, here what he said paul brings out is there is a possibility of disunity in serving the church 
Uh, this is given on page number 228. It's application first paragraph. Much of what Paul says about the community as a body is framed in response to the possibility of disunity, severing, okay, just severing, while as we have seen, unity in the local church is a reality to be acknowledged rather than a potential to be realized. Okay, But it is a sad truth that many people are just getting to know this uh, very recently and there are still many others who do not know or who do not uh, refer to church as a family or families or all the Christian as a body. But still what Paul is emphasizing is it is a very much real thing which has to be acknowledged because only while we acknowledge after that we are going to apply it in our daily lives. Because we are really going to give it a thought that yes, other members also, we all are just one in Christ that way. And then there is also a chance that there can be a division within a single, single community which results due to lack of agreement or lack of care for one another. No doubt that church is a body, but still like in a family also, there will be people who have different thoughts and different viewpoints, who have different temperaments. So their uh, idea of taking things or their idea of accepting things or reacting to things might be different. So here what uh, Paul is trying to tell is there is a chance that in the body of Christ, if at all there are people like this, uh, and obviously people are all different. We also saw unity in diversity. So the danger due to this diversity is that there can be a division in the single community. If at all, they do not care for one another or they do not agree. So in a church, <clears throat> in this body, people should learn how to disagree in a good manner and also lastly what paul is telling in galatians 5 20 is uh, there is uh, a chance that people would be believing only on the works of the flesh so here it says in this galatians So in the Reader 228 application first paragraph only we can see that Paul frequently appeals for such unity to be maintained in the face of possible or existing dissensions. When divisions occur, schism is present within the community. It was precisely this that had occurred at Corinth and threatened to take place in Rome and even Colossae. And hence Paul was writing and encouraging them. Rather than meaning divisions between churches, Scarce for Paul designates division within a single community. It results, he says, either from a lack of agreement with one another or from a lack of care for one another and is one of the works of the flesh. Okay, so yeah, uh, yes, this can be seen in our normal local churches also. So usually people who are belonging to the same place or people who are from the same state or same language, they tend to uh, get together with each other very often and very soon. Like, for example, I have uh, been brought up in Mumbai. So if at all I'll see any other Mumbai car, I would be willing to talk to that person more. Similarly with my mom, if at all she will see any other Mallu, then gone. Half an hour, she will be stuck with that particular Mallu only just because of that uh, same, uh, same similarity. So here what Paul is telling is that uh, this division may happen because people tend to cling to people of their particular culture or their particular state or language. So again, when we apply the whole concept of church being a body, this is a danger which Paul says one has to be careful. And then uh, regarding the originality of this metaphor body being used for church. So here what Paul says is there is Gnostic thought which says that there is interdependence of its members. So while this, uh, these two, uh, yes, Gnostic thought, the, I did not understand nicely faster that what is Gnostic thought. <clears throat> there was an entire group that, uh, there was a, a, a school of uh, theology that developed, probably existed before Christ, but with the coming of Christ, 
uh, there the the idea of gnostic uh, uh, gnostics is that there is special knowledge there is special knowledge <coughs> and that earth is not created by god but it is created by a lesser god and therefore christ came to this world christ did not be was not fully uh, was not fully uh, having a physical body because god who is pure can never be entangled in sin so they got weird stuff so uh, what in the gnostic thought so there's a lot of literature of gnostic the gnostic ideas are there so he is saying that possibly that uh, paul has used this metaphor from the gnostic content he is probably lived it is not there in the original uh, jewish uh, literature or the old testament so could be it, he had probably taken it from the greco roman uh, uh, literature but it was there especially from the gnostic yeah i i i hope you understood you will be studying john narcissism in detail in essentials of sound doctrines which is your next course you studied fully i mean you will completely know what narcissism is about in fact many of the content that is there in the new testament uh especially if john is countering gnosticism <clears throat> he is uh, text is mostly countering the gnostic idea which was very fast influencing uh the the, the just born church uh, so yeah i think that should do the job yes sir other than that there was only this stoic literature so stoic literature says that so stoic literature says that each individual has got different role to play and hence we should go to church and encourage each other and everyone is important also in this body that is in the church yes, that's it Okay, let's put our hands together for the husband and wife couple. Brilliant! Yeah. I mean, I I wonder if they teach this in the Bible colleges. Yes, <laughs> I mean it's so powerful, isn't it? I mean, we being trained. Uh, I, I I was just wondering if I under I underwent this training when I was in Manglo, and if Pastor Menezes and Pastor Nyanti well, would have. over the 7 8 years i was there actually at least in founded means i mean they did their best i mean i'm not definitely saying that they did not do their job they did a fantastic job that's why i'm here at you i, I attribute it completely to them but but what i'm saying is if we could train up our young ones if you could train up our people in uh, in in the, in this kind of content <clears throat> viewing what paul wrote and trying to uh, figure out the philosophy that he was trying to underlie underlay the in the with the idea of the church the community i, I think we would have powerful very powerful churches we would have uh, people who would uh, truly be committed uh, knowing this that we are supposed to be a family i i i find that that, that would be one of the most powerful philosophies for establishing uh, churches that means churches that will stay in the long run the churches that will uh, stay not just long run in this generation but would in succeeding generations that they would continue to uh, powerfully influence the community so i uh, the, so the, the there is evidence that because paul worked in this pattern using the idea of uh, pauline letters and other other tools to establish the churches the church that paul established they lasted five centuries that's what uh, uh, history says that paul's churches lasted five centuries and why because he established them in the manner that we are studying that's what you have one question one uh, competency question like that so we will get that eventually okay i think uh, what what do you all think about this uh, what we uh, read and studied today before we close for the day So much as to what do you think? Is the is it is this paradigm shifting? Mm, 
I I think I mean the the articles, of course, they're giving us a lot of detail on why Paul uses the metaphors and all that. But I, uh, it is obvious. It was a very good way of um, helping us understand. Uh, and uh, that article, Robert Bank says that metaphors were used in those times to help us understand. And uh, why, what he's getting us is to bring us back to the fact that we need to have an order in in our own households, and therefore it has to reflect in our church community as well. Basically, and he didn't have any other way but to take an example of a family is what I think. And uh, Paul starts from there. And uh, of course, Robert Banks is just helping us understand that why is he using these metaphors? The reason for using the metaphors. And But what do you think, uh, Super Sister, the idea of now that church is a family to me or it is the intent of the spirit to... Uh, place me in the context of a community that is uh, that is driven by the philosophy of family and now that I know and I, because I am part of a family uh, where I have a husband uh, and children uh, and I, I take care of them, I, I love them, I'll die for them kind of a scenario uh, and he's bringing that same implication of us being members of the church yeah. Who dropped off? Somebody dropped off. Yeah. So does that implication affect you? I'm just asking. I'm just asking everyone. I'm just. Uh... I think it affects in the sense, Pastor. We cannot hold everybody together and keep even within a family, right? When children grow up, we have taught them. We let them go. You know. I mean, if it was oh. like that, we all would have stayed as joint families. No, no, I think you missed the point. I What I'm talking about is the kind of concern I will have. Concern? Yeah, of course. Concern, again, that's what, because, you know, I mean, I was just thinking, I think it again begins many of, I have seen many a time people are very, very involved in church, but they have nothing to do with their own homes and families. Sometimes there are differences between brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles. Everything is in a mess there. But church, very good community, family of families, everything is happening. So all that, everything you put together, we have to understand. So it is a very difficult thing. It is not as easy as when we say family and community and all that. It doesn't work so easy, you know, Pastor. Sometimes we have differences. No, I understand. But when Paul is talking about the idea of community, Hmm. And Paul then draws out of that. Uh, he draws out many principles, practical aspects of that. He's basically implying that if my church is my family, yeah. then my uh, uh, imp the implications of that is equivalent to me taking care of my wife and my children. I need yeah. to be concerned about the... Yes. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that's a place that we all need to journey to eventually, uh, as even uh, uh, Elijah said, that for me, otherwise, church was a place where I came and demonstrated my skill. Uh, church is a place where I got someone to speak something nice to me. I have a good place. Of a, I, I can find good friends. I can find a good alliance or I can find, you know, Church became a means to an end, but it was more than that. In other words, uh, if we were able to, I mean, I mean, I'm actually going to preach on coming HSR and I didn't, not because of this, but I love to use uh, Elijah and Shruti's uh, PPT. Uh, I was going to speak on the idea of community and how the idea of community relates to the idea of tithing and offerings and things like that. Because I think the way we have taught tithing and offering itself is uh, we have created an idea of barter system or trading system. Uh, but if we've taught it in the way that God actually intended it, is that every community has an economy and every community has an economy that means within the community are producers and consumers. And that there is this in the whole economy that is going because of the producers and consumers, 
the community needs to be taken care of and that comes through taxes so tax was a common understanding for any community to exist and the economy to function taxes was a common thing so when paul when god actually tells this whole idea of a uh, giving in the old testament he was he was actually out of the nation of uh, out of the loins of abraham he brought a family out of the family out of the belly of israel he brought out of that family a nation he gave them the constitution and he ha- he built an economy for them and the economy is interesting that until the moment that they entered into canaan what stopped anybody knows i didn't get you pastor until he, they got into canaan when the moment they stepped into canaan the promised yeah. land yeah something stopped manna and all that exactly all that exactly because there was then an economy that has to be developed and that economy functioned with producers and consumers and the economy uh, had to take care of the governance and there was a a tax that was a normal part of an economy and that was god said that's what you need to do that if you are part of a community you have to take responsibility in the running of that community but what do we teach today people <laughs> Yeah, no. I think, uh, pastor, I think as children of God, or you know, when we call ourselves believers, nobody has to teach us these things. I think these things mm-hmm. have to come new uh, automatically. But Suma sister, Suma sister, when it comes to our own. No, but I don't see people giving in the church. Hey, how, would we take responsibility that I'm part of this community that I need to take care of all the welfare? I need to pay my part. because they don't realize it but pastors are good at doing this i mean i have done this they give and god will give you so we somehow pull money out of their pockets by uh, showing the carrot of hey if you are paying 100 rupees 1000 rupees guaranteed da <laughs> but that was not the way actually god intended it to work god was saying that if you are part of a community then that community is an economy has an economy and that economy has to be taken care of that has come has to come through the contribution of the members of that community and that was the tithe which is 23.5% in the old testament which included taking care of the levite community which included the poor which included the foreigners which included uh, all of those systems or that but but is a fantastic economy because nobody would ever remain poor for generations in the community of israel because every 50 years there was a reset button all the land will go back to the original owners what a brilliant idea so even the church the idea is to bring to awareness that you are a community you are a family you are if every family has a economy don't every family here have an economy there are producers and consumers the producers are the parents and the consumers are the children other children but do you want your children to remain consumers for the rest of your life every child you want them to grow and become producers so in, in every church every person eventually need to grow up in the idea of giving so that the economy will work so if we brought it like that and explain to the church then i should i give an example of uh, an apartment complex or a villa complex now uh, like let's say uh jo- jo- uh joshua is living in an apartment complex so suma is living in a villa complex now do you have to pay a monthly maintenance why because there is an ec- there is an economy that you have to support there is producers and consumers and you need to have this economy running so there has to be a monthly commitment to take care of the community but we cannot see that in the church So we will have to do all the enticement to get people to pay. Whereas if we taught them that you are part of a community, there is a responsibility, and that's what the Old Testament and the New Testament speaks about. Because Paul says very clearly to the Macedonians and the Corinthians, he says you need to give to Jerusalem because Jerusalem doesn't have money. But it was Jerusalem who actually sent out all the people and got all the churches established. So there is whoever produces once they became consumers, somebody else became producers. The idea is that 
the economy had to function. So he generated money out of Corinth. He generated money out of Macedonia, and he sent them to send it to Jerusalem, where there was no money. But it was all community dynamics, the whole idea and principle of how community works. Every community has an economy. And that economy is has to be taken care of by the members of that community. That's why we pay taxes, right? Because India has an economy, or Karnataka has an economy as a state. Bangalore has an economy as a state. And therefore, we all have to take care of that community through that economy, which is through taxes that we pay. And I'm planning to do that. So that's this is a good basis for me to teach this. All right. I think, Pastor uh, Joseph, will you pray and close? Though we have done only two and a half hours, because I came late, but I think we'll close at 11. Pastor Joseph, will you pray for all of us? Community as a family and community as a body. Pastor Joseph, what's happening? You're not unmuting, yeah? Pastor Joseph, are you able to hear us? I think Pastor Joseph is not able to hear us. We can't hear you, Pastor. You're unmute, not muted. Can you unmute? I think we still cannot hear you. There is a problem with my connection, Doctor. Okay. Pastor, can you pray and close for us? I'll pray. Loving Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Master God, that all that we learned regarding the family. God, we thank you that there are many things that we learned today. We submit everything into your loving hands, Master God. And Father God, help us, Master God, to even write our competency based on what we heard today. And we pray for all the participants, including our facilitator of the judge, and we submit all that we learned today and all that we are, Master God, in your loving hands, Master God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.